Copper is quite possibly humanity's most overlooked material. Given both its widespread functional use and its instrumental importance in our civilization across wide spans of time and space, as well as for its beauty, copper can be found on the periodic table. It's an element with an atomic number of 29. Now, I want to make this clear that this is not a video about chemistry. There are far better videos that you can watch on that matter. This is about the human element of copper, a soft metal that can be easily manipulated into a variety of shapes and sizes, and in turn can be used for a variety of products, both functional and ornamental. It is also one of the best conductors of electricity and heat, most likely only second to silver making it phenomenally functional, not only in the days of yonder, but today. Pretty much everything from your electrical devices contains some degree of copper. The electricity that fuels the world runs on the highways of this orange metallic metal. And this has had a profound impact on a vast time span, ranging from the days of ancient Egypt to the modern day, and most likely for centuries into the future. From the humble wires in some of your electronic devices to the Statue of Liberty, this beautiful metal has shaped human civilization in ways so profound yet so subtle. Copper, after all, is considered to be one of the seven metals of antiquity alongside gold, lead, silver, tin, mercury, and iron. As stated in one of my previous videos, ancient peoples would not have been able to distinguish between different types of gas elements such as oxygen, nitrogen, or hydrogen, but they clearly would have been able to tell the difference between various types of metals that they were digging from the earth. Copper would be one of the easiest metals to identify, not just because of its distinct, beautiful, orangish, brownish, reddish, metallic color, but also due to the fact that it's relatively abundant, and occurs not too deep inside of the Earth's crust, as well as the fact that it has a pretty low melting point. Most students of history will be familiar with the Stone Age, which is followed by the Bronze Age and then the Iron Age. These terms are not so much used by historians, but rather by archaeologists, as they are the ones studying the tools, weapons, and other items produced by people of antiquity before writing. However, a lot of people don't know that there was actually a Copper Age in between the Stone and Bronze Age. Bronze, for those of you who don't know, basically combines copper with tin. Tin was relatively rare in the Eastern Mediterranean. It was predominantly found in certain areas such as the British Isles and was smelted in the Greek island of Crete. This would require some sailors, as the Phoenicians did, traveling all the way to what is now England in search of this light, cheap metal. For this reason, it made sense that the first metal people would widely use copper without the tin to create copper tools in and of themselves before eventually transitioning to bronze. Before the rise of mass tin production, they would have to rely on copper alone. Archaeologists have found traces of smithing not only in the eastern Mediterranean and much of the Middle East where most early civilizations resided in, but in also places as far as the Americas, showing a certain degree of cultural and technological convergent evolution when it came to copper and then bronze wielding. You have probably heard of Iceman, Europe's oldest mummy. Many of you have probably looked at the date of which he lived in, which was over 5,000 years ago, and probably thought that he was a Stone Age guy, when in reality he actually had an axe with a copper head. Copper melts at 1,804 degrees Celsius, which while not being a great temperature could go tanning in, is very easy to achieve in comparison to, say, iron. Tin has an even lower melting point at 231 degrees Celsius, or 449 degrees Fahrenheit. Both tin and copper are soft metals, which make them pretty lousy at producing spears and daggers to stab people with alone. However, when you mix them together, they produce bronze, which is far harder and far better at stabbing people with. And yes, sure, sometimes other metals like nickel and zinc were added to the mix, but the combination of copper and tin would be a dynamic duo. They would produce everything from bronze-tipped spears, as well as a variety of other products such as pots and pans. Around 6,000 years ago, bronze was still the cutting edge of technology. 
empires would rise and fall in part due to their ability to find copper and tin, and forge it into a variety of bronze items. However, the Bronze Age did indeed collapse. And along with it collapsed the New Kingdom of Egypt, Mycenaean Greece, and the Indo-European Hittites due to various mysterious circumstances. In the aftermath of the Dark Ages that followed the Bronze Age collapse, there would be a new metal in town that would steal the limelight from bronze and the copper residing in bronze, and that would be iron. Iron has a much higher smoke point, but it's also far more abundant. With the advent of better technology, it would soon overtake the use of copper and bronze. If you look at technological changes, in human history, a great deal of it has to do with the ability to forge fire at higher and higher temperatures. Oftentimes the more power and energy you wield, the more powerful you are. Now it's worth pointing out that technological evolution is oftentimes contingent on the environment you're in, and not every culture in the world progressively changed their technology with the same track record that you saw in the Eastern Mediterranean. For example, in much of Sub-Saharan Africa, they went from a Stone Age to an Iron Age and just skipped the Bronze Age. We see a similar trend in parts of the Americas as well to a lesser extent. Archaeologists have been quite fond of copper plates alongside the Mississippi River. While far, far away from ancient Egypt and Greece, many of the indigenous peoples of the Americas were clearly capable of some degree of metallurgy, even though it wasn't anywhere near as widespread as it was in the Old World. With the advent of iron for the use of swords and tools in the old world, along with a variety of other items, the use of copper would eventually fade out to some degree. Copper, nonetheless, took on a more ornamental role. Its beauty, after all, proved to be long-lasting, in sharp contrast to iron, which is a pretty ugly metal. Copper is a beautiful reddish, goldenish, orangish, pinkish color, and the Romans associated it with the goddess of love, Venus which, unsurprisingly, they ripped off of Aphrodite, who was the Greek goddess of love, oftentimes associated with iron as well, for some reason. Now, while copper is not as coveted as gold or silver, it was still coveted nonetheless. The reason being is that gold and silver were far more rare, and scarcity creates value in and of itself. At the end of the day, I don't think that there's anything objectively more beautiful about a shiny yellow color that you see in gold compared to a shiny orangish color that you see in copper. I think that at the end of the day, the main reason for this divergence in value probably had to do with the degree to which gold was far less common and far harder to find than copper. This still exists to this day, as we give gold medals to the number one athlete, followed by silver medals to the second best athlete, and then bronze medals to the third best. Copper's reputation as being highly valuable, yet not precious, would make it perfect for the use of coins, which incorporated into the Roman Empire, and this trend of using copper for coins still exists to varying degrees today. However, by and large, it has been overtaken by zinc and other metals. Much of the production during the Roman Empire was in Hispania, which would later become Spain and Portugal. After all, this area of Europe had a great deal of hills and mountains, which made it great for mineral deposits. On top of that, there were slowly but surely many people realized that copper had some limited applications to healthcare. While many people at the time had no idea that microorganisms like bacteria were moving around everything, they did note that interactions with certain substances would lead to more or less diseases than others. And it just so happens to be that copper has a great deal of antimicrobial properties. Throughout the Middle Ages, copper was just in the background, overshadowed by iron and later steel, which is an iron alloy. However, various applications were coming into fruition during the Industrial Revolution. Copper, turns out, as I said before, is one of the best conductors of electricity, possibly only second to silver. But unlike silver, which is extremely expensive and far more rare, you won't need to burn your wallet in order to get it. And thereby, it became the default and the most preferred metal to produce wires with. To this day, copper remains the dominant material not only used for wires and cables, but also generators at power plants. 
The cable you plug your toaster into has copper, at least most of the time. The production of circuit boards, electrical motors, solar panels, and just about anything that involves electricity probably contains some degree of copper. With many economies switching to renewable energy, the production of copper will almost certainly increase, given the role that copper plays in the production of solar, wind, and geothermal energy, along with other renewable resources. With many global economies switching to renewable energy production, there will inevitably be an increase in the demand of copper, particularly with the rise of solar power. And in spite of its renewed use on the functional level, it's still used for ornamental purposes in the modern day. One of the most famous examples of this is, of course, the Statue of Liberty, a gift from France to the United States celebrating 100 years of independence. Now, you may be thinking, well, the Statue of Liberty doesn't have the same color as copper. It's green, or bluish green, or more accurately, teal. That's because when copper oxidizes, it comes into contact with, well, oxygen, namely from the air or water. It eventually turns into a bluish green teal color. And that's why the Statue of Liberty has its iconic teal U. After all, it's basically a statue island surrounded by water and air, so it's not surprising. You can see this trend in various other structures, such as the rooftops of certain churches that are copper-plated, that can be found in numerous Victorian buildings. If you live in an area that was once part of the British Empire, take a look at some of the churches or heritage buildings in the region that you live in, and chances are you will probably see some copper roofing with some teal roofs. Today, much of the copper production is centered around the nation of Chile, particularly in the northern region of Chile known as the Atacama Desert, the driest place on earth. A place I've had the pleasure of visiting myself. I can guarantee you that a very significant chunk of electrical devices in your household contain some forms of copper, particularly copper from Chile. Now, the way that the government of Chile has managed copper has varied from decade to decade, alternating between various forms of nationalization and privatization depending on the circumstance. You may have also heard of more recent applications of copper since the COVID pandemic in 2020. With more research supporting the claims that copper has antimicrobial properties, many governments, particularly local governments, have promoted the use of copper surfaces in areas that are widely used by large numbers of people, such as the railways at subway stations, which are sometimes copper-coated or covered in a copper alloy as it destroys numerous microorganisms. This has been empirically proven. Copper is really good at killing a lot of diseases, or more accurately, organisms that may cause diseases. On top of that, many people have sought copper products, not simply for ornamental uses, but also for the use of kitchen and bathroom products where you're most likely to deal with microorganisms given the higher moisture levels. With a newfound love of copper, alongside an interest in renewable energy, as well as this ornamental beauty, we kind of still are living in the copper age. It really didn't finish at all. It just took a slight dip and detour and is now re-emerging. With the digital age coming in full force, every aspect of your life is connected through these copper wires. Copper also is simultaneously a renewable slash non-renewable resource. On one hand, it's not renewable because it's not sunlight or water. There is a finite amount of copper in the world, but in sharp contrast to say oil, copper can be scrapped reforged and reused. This makes it not only useful, but reusable. Oh, and did I mention that copper is also essential for your diet, albeit in very small amounts? You can gain a copper deficiency without enough copper in your diet, which can wreak havoc on your circulatory system, and you can even develop anemia, which reduces your blood's ability to get your red blood cells around to transport oxygen. So make sure you have enough copper in your diet. Granted, I wouldn't recommend eating any copper coins. So there we have it. That's a brief overview of the immense history and importance of this oftentimes overlooked material. Next time you plug in any electronic device, keep in mind that this metal has had a profound impact on your life, the lives of your ancestors, and most likely the lives of your descendants.